Hi, and welcome to our guest artist series. Today's guest artist is Carl B. Oxley. Hi. Hi, and welcome to our artist series interview. Thank you so much for being willing to do this and share some information about yourself. So um, I'd like to start with just a very simple question, like where are you from? Uh, I am from Michigan. I was born in Gaylord and then grew up and spent most of my life um, until I was um, a teenager. I went to school in Sheboygan, which is a very small town. Um, and then when I was in my 20s, I moved to Lansing and then eventually to the Detroit area. I moved to Hamtramck in 2004 and spent 10 years there and then moved to Royal Oak. Oh, okay. And then what field or uh, media would you say that you work in primarily? I work mostly with acrylic and spray paint. All right. And then your subject matter? My subject matter is usually very simple characters, uh, mostly animals, things that are friendly and familiar to the widest variety of people available. I love that. Things that are friendly. We need that more in the world, don't we? Yes. Yeah. And that's my main goal is to present something that is very, um, what's the word? It's very open and very tangible and accessible to the widest viewer audience. Um, a three-year-old or an 80-year-old or a 40-year-old all recognize the same image and the same um, kind of connections to that animal, if it's a monkey or a giraffe or a rabbit or um, an elephant, everybody of any age has an understanding of what that is and what that could be. And there's no kind of um, religious or political involvement. It's just a thing that you can look at and you don't have to feel any way about it and you can just enjoy it. Great. So would you say, um, as far as the style goes, um, how, well, how would you describe it, the style? Um, mo most people would say it's uh, reminiscent of pop art. It is illustrative in a lot of ways. My biggest, um, goodness, my biggest inspiration was Keith Haring. I saw in uh, high school, actually, um, when I was 16 years old. I saw Drawing Line, a portrait of Keith Haring, which is a fantastic video um, and totally just kind of brought my world together and made me, it kind of, his vision of how art should be for everyone and accessible to everyone really tied with my values and what I wanted to see art happen. Um, and that really brought it all together for me. A lot, you know, I grew up on cartoons like most kids my age. Um, and I was also very, um, very inspired by skateboarding graphics um, and stickers and t-shirts and how that was all very kind of commercial and available. It was, it was art that was available to kids. It was art that's available to teenagers. Um, and I found that really interesting that like people would collect stickers or skateboards and all this imagery and the different ways you could present so many different images um, for a low value of money. Um, that's really enticing and that really excited me. That kind of reminds me of the connection to Keith Haring as well with his pop shop. Right, yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's what I really loved and the idea that you could just take art and then you could give it to everybody. And that's really, what art is supposed to be. It's great to have art in museums and it's important that we have, um, you know, very famous paintings that are hanging in museums and that's great. Although it's not the same as having something at home. And so it's much more important for people to have art in their homes than to just go see it. Um, people love art, everybody loves art, I think, <laughs> uh, or everybody has the potential to love art. Um, and and a long time ago, or even today, there's certain brackets and certain levels of art that are unattainable to a lot of people, uh, which doesn't seem very fair to me. And um, yeah, I think, I think people should be able to live with the things that they love and have beautiful things in their home that inspire them and make them feel good. 
Well, and I think that that's also another connection you brought up, Keith Herring, that, that was his aim and his purpose too, to really, um, you know, be that positive light and that presence in the world. And, um, you know, he was also an advocate, uh, speaking for those who didn't have a voice possibly. But um, in, the, in the end, I think when you look at his work, it was a lot of happiness and a lot of sparks and joy. And I can totally see that in your work. And um, I can so I can completely see that connection. I'm glad that you brought that up. Yeah, I mean, I really feel like I am my own person, but in a lot of ways, I feel like I am a continuation of his work. Um, and that's really what I've tried to be. If I've tried to be anything is somebody who was just contributing as much as I could because I have the ability. Yes, absolutely. And then the color choices that you use, it definitely, I would have to say and agree with you that it would fall into what people would consider pop. But can you talk about that at all with, with your color? Did that evolve? Or when you started initially uh, creating artwork, were you really um, able to, to work in that way? Or did you have to develop that? Um, I think my color use has always been, you know, it started pretty, it started very based in pop art. I was really drawn by the simplicity. Um, and over time I have really um, kind of gotten more intricate and, and more kind of blended, but not blended with my work. Um, I like the layers to be visible. I don't like to really blur the layers too much. Um, there's a piece behind me here um, and I can actually hold it up. So I've done some where you can kind of see that there's some gradient, um, but I also really like the sharp contrast. And I like you to be able to tell that this is laying on top of this, is laying on top of this, um, because it shows a history. Um, and especially with this, my more recent work, the style of work is based on graffiti art. Um, and graffiti to me is interesting as an art form um, because it's temporary. And it is very much this same style where someone has done the dark blue and then someone else comes over and does a purple and then somebody else covers it with a light blue and then someone covers it with a white. And then you've created something as a group of people because little remnants of the people that came before you are still here. I love that. So yeah, that's really where my focus has been um, with my color usage and my layering process in the past two years is really kind of trying to show graffiti art, the street art has become very popular in the past decade. And I, you know, it started very early with Keith Haring and, and Jean-Michel Basquiat. And I think it's evolved into this new thing. And I think it, what I'm really trying to show people is kind of why it's so intriguing to people, why people find it so fascinating. And it really is this collective effort. That's maybe what people don't understand that they enjoy so much about graffiti and street art is that there are, even though somebody else's work has been covered up or buffed over, whatever, there's still little pieces left. So there's all this history. So your art becomes part of everyone else's. And so it's all shared. That makes me think about, um, you know, seeing your art, I've seen a bit of it out there. And then I've also, you know, seen it on, on social media. Um, can you talk about some of the ways that um, you create the art and, and where one might see it or find it, aside from going directly to your website? Yeah, I've been fortunate over the years. I've been asked by a lot of communities to create murals. So I have um, murals of my work in various parts of the Detroit area and throughout the country. Um, in Detroit, my first, my very first mural was at um, the intersection of Grand River, Trumbull, and is it Michigan Avenue? Where the three roads intersect. It's the Woodbridge neighborhood. Um, this was about 15 or 16 years ago, um, friend Mark Sangbush and I were asked to come in and do this mural um, on a community center that was this newer kind of evolving neighborhood in Detroit. Um, and so we painted this giant giraffe and then a sunrise and the giraffe became the symbol of this neighborhood over the years. And a few years ago, we went to do some retouching and make the art refreshed. It had gotten kind of old and discolored over the years. 
Um, and so we did a, a refresh painting on it. And I found out one of the local soccer teams was using it as a mascot for their team. And um, so, and people really identify with it as part of their neighborhood. So it's interesting how, you know, as a 20 something, I was asked to come and paint this wall. Um, and years later, people know it without knowing me um, and just know that it's become this living organic thing that I have something to do with, but really is not connected to me anymore. But it, it kind of solidified and became this icon or true icon of a neighborhood. Uh, and it was really fascinating. Yeah, that's great. So um, it's like a place making, but it then took on a life of its own. They just adapted it and it's yeah. a part of who they are. Yeah. So going back to that painting you just showed us, will you then be putting a character on top of that or? Yes. Yeah, I have been doing some abstract work recently, um, but the new series of work with these, I will be doing characters. I have a, a body of about 20 paintings right now that I've been working on outside all summer, kind of layering with spray paint. Um, and then this fall and winter, I'll be able to work on them in the studio. Um, in the basement, adding some more layers and some smaller details, and then eventually some characters on top. So that there's a lot of real interesting things happening, a lot of layers um, and a lot of things to look at. So when you see it from afar, you'll be able to see the image, that, that icon, that symbol of whatever character, bunny or a monkey. And then when you get close, there'll be a lot of things to investigate. Well, that's great. So do you actually mask out the shape then when you do go in to add the animal character? No, I do it all freehand, um, which 99% of the time works. And 1% of the time I completely fail and get angry and stab the canvas with a, a paintbrush or a screwdriver or whatever, um, which happens to all of us. Um, that's a whole other art movement though there, right? So save, yes. save those off too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but I try not to do that anymore. And I try to read repaint my canvases and, and save them, but um, I have been known to stab a painting. <laughs> oh, and sometimes you need that release um, yeah, in the yeah. creative process. Yeah, I, I can relate to that. <laughs> or you need to just walk away, <laughs> come back another day and see what yeah. can be done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you. I'm wondering um, with your work being, it's like you said, more pop art, it's a bit stylized. Have you ever been approached um, to do some graphic artwork or or like you said, how that, um, you know, your giraffe was kind of almost taken on as, as a logo or a mascot. Have, have you ever been approached uh, with your characters? I have. And actually um, I designed around the same time period that I painted the giraffe about 15 or 16 years ago, I um, was approached by um, a small starting recycling company in Detroit called um, Recycle Here. And they wanted um, to kind of have a B as their logo. And they wanted, uh, they wanted to use the slogan B Green. Um, and they were also very interested in pollination and things like this. And so it was kind of a tie-in and they asked if there was some way I could turn a bee and make it look like a recycling logo. Um, and so after a few days, I came up with just making a very simple bee. Um, I can actually draw one really quickly. And what I did was I just drew a bee with a happy face and for his stripes, I made three arrows and it got adapted and changed a little bit over the years, but essentially this is what it was. Um, and it became another thing that grew much beyond me and beyond even what the creators of the company and the founders of the company thought it would be. Uh, it became this icon and this recognizable thing and people understood it and knew that's where the recycling was going uh, in the community. They became the main recycling company of Detroit um, and were the first, I think, the first curbside pickup for Detroit. Um, so yeah, it just grew way beyond me. And, and then even still, um, that company reached out to me um, because a friend of theirs had been in uh, Denver, Colorado at a hotel at a Marriott. And they had a printout of my logo, their logo on one of their recycling bins in their hotel. So they had no affiliation with the company, but it had, be, it had become this like symbol of recycling that the 
the wider world had thought, well, this is great. And so they used it, you know, without permission, but <laughs> interesting still. It is. It's fascinating how just pictures can speak or represent um, a whole idea or movement. And yes. you know that um, that you've succeeded when when your work can do that and then extend beyond you even even without your efforts. Right. Yeah, it's really wild. So I'm wondering too, um, have you ever thought about um, using these characters uh, perhaps in uh, maybe a story form, uh, book form, short story video form, because they are so animated? And I have, I really have. And I've been approached over the years, considered, you know, children's books and this kind of thing. Um, but I think that once you start to build a story with them, then you're locked into a certain path. And I really don't want that. I really want them to be, I don't want them to have names. You can name them if you like, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is. I still want that open. I want a child to be able to decide what it is. I want an adult to decide what it is. I don't want to do that for you. I want you to be able to take your life experience and come to it and then connect that with yourself. And, and I don't wanna put any kind of story with that. I love that idea of keeping it open-ended and free. Uh, Cause the other side of it is like you said, then it's fixed, it has a name, it has a character, it has a temperament or personality. And then mm -hmm. that's the end of it. And there's, there's nothing outside of that. And right. I think there, that, that there's value in that, you know, for, for some in their work, certainly, and and it it might even be necessary, you know, to share sort of um, some of these um, archetypal stories or lessons. Yeah. But if um, yeah, on the other side of it, if that's not speaking to you and you want to have your work be open ended, there's certainly a need for that. I know even with my own work, I do abstract paintings. I I typically. I'm not comfortable naming them because again, like you said, I want the viewer to enter into it, um, you know, with what they're coming with and how it speaks to them and, um, you know, not let what perhaps I might think it's called, um, you know, in inhibit their ability to connect with it. So, yeah. I actually really, you know, uh, I have, pages and pages of um, painting titles written out because sometimes I just sit around. Um, um, it was a process my friend and I started just as kind of like a creative outlet. Um, and it was just taking words or strings of words and kind of like putting them together in random orders or weird little phrases. And then just looking at a painting and going, oh yeah, that seems fitting or that doesn't seem fitting. And so that's what I'll call it. And so it kind of makes, it's kind of making it hard for people to attach the, the title to the piece. And so it just creates more questioning, which I really like to do. I am, I have been um, told many times that I'm kind of, uh, I kind of like to push people to do things. I really want people to interact. Um, and so I think that's one way that I'm able to do that is putting really interesting titles on the paintings so that they don't really relate or people have to really kind of puzzle over why it would be called such a thing. I think that's so important. Um, we do um, have so much just already shaped and inundated with so many visuals and it's mm. already sort of fixed in telling us what it is and what to think of it or what to make yes. of it. And I think yes. it's important for, for us to have that um, real connection and, 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 you know, for us to stand in front of a work and, and just contemplate, what is this? What is it to me? What is it that the artist is trying to say? And then kind of finding that middle ground of really um, the experience of connecting to it. Yeah. yeah, I think that has been really important to me is that you can look at it and you can say, this is what the artist has done. And this is what they, you can even see maybe um, a mission, uh, uh, concept or a, a mission statement or some some kind of uh, blurb about the painting and that's been determined what it is but you can also and and more importantly you should be able to take away from it what you want um, without that input and just say well I think it's something completely different um, because that may very well be the case yeah and it is to each each of us right yes uh, because we're coming with different experiences and yeah. 
um, you know, taking things in differently as well, the way that we perceive. So that's entirely right. okay. Yeah. yeah. And oftentimes, uh, I know the artists, when they hear um, something outside of what they ever imagined it to be, um, I think that they're also a little bit um, excited and and open to receiving that. I know that's happened to mm -hmm. me before with my work. And so that that can, you know, it's just expands the conversation like you said not only get them thinking but then it just kind of expands the conversation further that the art then is even offering so much more when it then again comes back into the hands of the creator and then they can look and contemplate in that way and go oh I see that too now yeah absolutely and I always have told people you know they ask if you know I have a lot of paintings in my house I have a lot of friends who are artists we collected art over the years and they'll, they'll say, oh, is that yours? And they say, no, I don't really display my own art. And it's because um, once I'm finished with a painting, it's not mine anymore. Uh, the painting, it, you know, the ideas come from wherever, the clouds, the sky, I don't know. The idea comes to me, I do the painting. Once it's done, it's not mine anymore. It goes into the world. And so then it's the world's job to decide what it is. It's not mine anymore, it's theirs. And so it is great to like hear, um, what people see or what people feel when they see it or interact with it. Um, that's like so uh, elating to, to feel. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So I'm just wondering uh, for our viewers um, in particular, what would you say if you could go back and talk to your teenage self in regards to, you know, your idea of being an artist or doing artwork? I would probably tell myself that everything was going to change and it was going to change all the time and that would be okay. And it would probably make me a lot less frustrated over the years. Um, yeah, change is good, but it's also hard. And the real good change is often the hardest. And I think that's the advice that I would like to be given. Yeah, that's it. Like you said, it is hard. And even listening to the advice, it's hard. But yeah. seeing you come through on the other side and just being so established in your art, just knowing your own practice and, you know, being able to produce so much and, and give back to the community with, with this, uh, you know, just very joyful work. Um, I, I think that that's such valuable information because it's true everything changes and especially at at that age um, it's constantly changing but um, perhaps it can prepare us for the future when we do come across changes here and there which we will and um, yeah yeah I mean really it is truly when and especially like looking back when I was a teenager and you've you know at 17 years old you're you're very certain you know exactly what's going on um, everywhere and you actually have absolutely no clue what's going on <laughs> anywhere. Um, and even at 41, I'm just barely now starting to grasp what's really happening in the world at, at large and in my community even, and how I interact with the world. Um, we are just barely starting to scratch the surface of how we all connect. Um, and I think you just have to try to be really open because what you've seen at, at 17 or 18 years old is just a minute fraction of what is there, what is available to you. Um, and the world starts to open and blossom in so many directions. Um, yeah, there's a lot to look forward to. Oh, thank you so much. And well, thank you. Thank you for sharing, um, you know, the, the process and, um, you know, the inspiration that uh you have and 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 most of all thank you for sharing your art with the world oh certainly it's my job <laughs> it is indeed <laughs> <laughs> all right well um I, again i i really appreciate you meeting with us and i'm sure we're gonna be very inspired we'll share any work that comes out of um our inspirations from learning about you and your work and um, just say bye for now. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.